Hi there, welcome to Exam AZ 900 Microsoft Azure Fundamental Study Guide. This is episode 15 of 50, May 2020 Content Catch-Up. Yes, if you've been following me in the series thus far, you're kind of thinking, wait a minute, I thought we were episode X of 63 or something. Well, hang on, that's the purpose of this episode, to bring you up to speed and bring you up to date. Our objectives today are, first of all, to describe the 2020 AZ900 objective domain changes. I happened to be surprised, as surprised as anybody else the other day, to go to the AZ900 exam page and look at the OD, the objective domain, and see how dramatically different it is. Yes, 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 that's part of the nature of the ever-shifting sands of Microsoft Azure in general, and Microsoft Azure role-based certification in particular. We then need to catch up on some new content that would have been in my previous 14 episodes. Specifically, from the compute area, we need to understand some basics of Windows Virtual Desktop, as well as the Docker container products in Azure, ACI and AKS. And then for database, data platform, I need to differentiate Azure Database for MySQL and Azure Database for PostgreSQL. Let's get started. Now then, Microsoft Worldwide Learning, that's the division that handles Microsoft certification, they revisit each of these role-based certifications yearly. And I should have had it on my calendar, but sure enough, around this time, March 2020, marks about the yearly anniversary of the AZ900 Azure Fundamentals exam. The bummer there, from my perspective, is I saw absolutely no announcement on this on the Microsoft Worldwide Learning blog. I just happened by happenstance to go to the AZ900 page and see that the objective domain was very different. This new content will go into effect on May 28th, 2020, so I'm being proactive and I'm restructuring. Actually, I've already restructured the content for this online study guide. I'll walk you through the spreadsheet, which you can get at timw.info forward slash az900 in our demo today. That's about all I have to say about that until the demo. Let's get into the technical content that is part of the additions, the May 28th, 2020 additions to the objective domain. The first of those additions is a product called Windows Virtual Desktop, also called WVD. Now, this product fills an important gap that Azure had for quite a while. There was no turnkey virtual desktop infrastructure or VDI solution natively in Azure. You'd have to use something like Citrix. Now, what the heck is VDI, Tim? Virtual desktop infrastructure is where you can stream Windows client desktops to your users. Now, I date back in IT long enough to where I remember dumb mainframe terminals where you'd have just an amber display monochrome monitor on your desk and you'd have a keyboard and you'd have a serial network connection that tethered you to the mainframe and you had no compute going on on your desktop. That's effectively what we've got here. The ability to give our users, we know that the users nowadays are gonna have compute, but they are not even necessarily using all the compute on their own desktop or laptop or even mobile device. You see on the left part of this slide, the RD clients nowadays can be anything. We can get to a desktop via a browser using HTML5 from an Android, Apple, or Windows tablet device, no problem and the user can get to their Windows 10 desktop from wherever they are in the world. It's a very important part of business. It's not so much that we're trying to save compute like we did back in the mainframe days. It's that we want to be able to give our workers their desktop wherever they are. I mean, it's very timely now as of this recording with the COVID-19 virus going on and so many people being forced to do work from home. Of course, the worker's question is, how do I get to all my stuff? This is a solution to this because they can stream their client desktop from, as I said, wherever they are. Now, we don't need to get under the weeds big time here because the AZ900 is not necessarily a technical course. But what we've got with WVD is effectively a hosted Windows Remote Desktop Services or RD Desktop for short implementation. So you can see in the middle part of this diagram, You've got some of the mechanics that are happening under the hood. Those are all parts of remote desktop services that's been part of Windows Server for quite a few years. And then on the right part of the slide, you have the management plane, how you're authenticating your users, integrating them with Active Directory and Azure Active Directory, and how you're doing the management. But at the end of the day, 
your users will simply, to get to their Windows 10 desktop, open up a web browser like you see in this screenshot, select their desktop, and then they can just work using all of the applications and user profile data that they're accustomed to when they're, say, at the office, but they can get to that same environment from home, from vacation, from quarantine, or wherever they might be. So that's Windows Virtual Desktop. Next, we have Docker containers. Containers are effectively isolated applications. And the best way to just briefly describe the benefit that containers bring to businesses and IT departments is, first of all, the virtual machine is, for all intents and purposes, a self-contained computer. You're not only dealing with the application, like let's say your VM will run a database like SQL Server or MySQL. You're not only responsible with a VM for the application and all of its dependencies, but you're also managing the entire guest operating system, whether that be Linux or Windows Server. And that brings into issues like security hardening and backing up and just the slowness of those VMs. They're not very agile. The idea with a container is that you can define just the application and its dependencies and start and stop them very quickly, much faster than VMs. And they're also much more agile than VMs. They're more portable than VMs as well. A VM that's running in Amazon Web Services, for example, is going to require some surgery to get it to run in the Azure cloud. Likewise, going from on-premises into a cloud, there's normally some conversion and other things you have to do. By contrast, Docker containers, as long as you have the Docker runtime environment running on your host server, it doesn't matter whether you run your containers in Azure, AWS, on-premises, they're completely transparent that way. So for these reasons and others, Docker containers are big in business nowadays, but the exam is going to require us to know the Azure products that support Docker containers. One more thing, though, before I show you those products. Let's take a look at this diagram. Another thing that you might want to look at with Docker containers is their workflow, their build and deployment workflow. What's so cool about Docker containers is that you build the image. The image is effectively the deployment unit. You can think of an image like, remember the old school software where you could buy a software license and get the software on a CD? <laughs> I guess you can still do that nowadays, but that CD or that installer package is the analog to the Docker image. But how do you get to that compiled Docker image? Well, you actually have a plain text file called a Docker file, and that's essentially a script that will build from source files your Docker image, which is your deployable unit. So you might have, your development team might have a Docker image for different versions of MySQL database. Maybe they have several images for Microsoft SQL Server database. Likewise, there may be Microsoft IIS web server images. You see what I mean? So for each layer of the application stack, you've got these. And to go back to Docker files, you can keep your Docker files in source code control, like in a Git repository, so that you track all the changes and teams can work on these Docker files collaboratively. Likewise, we need some kind of repository or registry to store your images, and then your developers can start or run those containers very quickly and agilely. Now, finally, we get to the exam objective. What are the main options for hosting Docker containers in Microsoft Azure? Well, first, there is a registry, a cloud-hosted registry called Azure Container Registry, or ACR. And this is a place where your developers can upload or push images from their computer into the registry. And then they can start or run those containers. They can download or pull them from the registry to their local computer. It's very flexible, very collaborative. Next, there's Azure Container Instance, or ACI. This is a way to very quickly, again, start containers, either from an Azure Container Registry or from another registry elsewhere, like Docker Hub or another option. And then lastly, we have Azure Kubernetes Service, or AKS. The main differentiation between Azure Container Instance and Azure Kubernetes Service is that the container instances are not necessarily orchestrated. You'll find that once your developers really get into containers, especially when they begin hosting line of business applications in those containers, in order to maintain your security compliance and your service level agreements, you're going to want to do things like high availability, disaster recovery. So you'll need an orchestration engine. That's what Kubernetes is. And AKS is simply an Azure hosted Kubernetes service. The last thing I'll say about Docker on Azure is that the Azure development teams worked closely and continue to work closely with Docker, the Docker Corporation, 
And Microsoft feels very strongly that you shouldn't have to learn a separate tool set to use Docker. You should still be able to use your native tooling, your Docker command line interface, your Kubernetes command line interface, your Kubernetes web dashboard UI. So you can use all of those tools, but then layer on top of them Azure Resource Manager features that we've discussed at the start of this course. Things like taxonomic tags, role-based access control, and Azure Policy. Now, with respect to PaaS, Platform as a Service Hosted Relational Databases, we looked previously in this online study guide at Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, now known as Azure Synapse. But there's a couple other options for relational in Azure, and they correspond to the most popular non-Microsoft relational database products, like MySQL would be a good example. So again, we've got a first-class hosted environment for these databases. Same thing with Maria. MariaDB is basically the same thing as MySQL. It's just that MySQL is an Oracle product, and MariaDB is a completely open open source community project fork of the MySQL database. Lastly, PostgreSQL is yet another top-line community open source relational database. Now you might be thinking, Tim, well, what about things like Oracle Database proper? There, I would suggest you look at network virtual appliances, which are pre-configured virtual machines that have Oracle Database preloaded. Oracle Database is supported for migration into Azure, but at least now we don't have a PaaS product for Oracle Database. You'll have to run it in IaaS in a virtual machine. Now let's get into that demo where I'll drill into the AZ900 2020 changes in more detail. Let's start by going out to the web to the AZ900 Microsoft Azure Fundamentals Blueprint page. And you can see right at the top of the page in red, the content of this exam will be updated on May 28th. Please download the Skills Measured document. And if we scroll down the page to Skills Measured, we can look at the PDF. That's what this Download Exam Skills Outline link is for. I happen to have it loaded into another browser. And if we start to scroll through the list here, the objective domain is what Microsoft Worldwide Learning calls this outline as a whole. You've got the original pre-May 2020 outline that I based the online course on. And then if you keep scrolling, we get into what I call redline text, where you can see additions and subtractions. Remember, I'm pretty sure I explained this in the study guide earlier. If I didn't, let me explain it again. The reason Worldwide Learning revisits and restructures these certifications every year is to make sure that the content is still current with how these skills are used in the real world. So you can see that Microsoft's made some pretty big changes to the audience profile. I'm not going to read this for you. I would suggest you just read it on your own. And if we scroll down to Skills Measured, you can see we've got a few different changes. We've got a lot of verbiage changes instead of understand, describe. That's relatively minor. Instead of describe, identify. You can see that they've changed the way weightings of these different sections, and they've added and subtracted. Again, I'd encourage you to just take a look at this on your own. If you're watching this video after in late May or beyond, it's not so much of an issue because these changes will have become generally available. But I just want you to see the sea of red here in terms of additions and subtractions. It's all restructured. They totally wiped out some top-level functional groups and renamed and reorganized them. In whole, I actually think that the changes are really good. I think that they make a lot of sense, as a matter of fact. I just am a little ticked off, frankly, that Microsoft Worldwide Learning didn't notify anybody. For example, I'm a technical editor of the Microsoft Press AZ900 exam ref book, and and none of us at MS Press had any idea this was happening. I'm kind of complaining, and I'm sorry about that, but it's just, I care. That's all. Now, I keep giving you in every one of my videos a link to timw.info forward slash az900. And if you've clicked that link, you probably, if you're not familiar with GitHub, you might be like, what is this? GitHub is a Microsoft property. It's a cloud-hosted Git repository index. And in my Timothy Warner account, I've created a repository to store the az900 objective spreadsheet. And I created the spreadsheet as a table of contents to this online study guide, okay? Now you can see the last commit I made was just three days ago, so I've updated the XLS to May 2020 objectives. If you're not familiar with Git or GitHub yet, you might be wondering, well, how do I download these files? Well, you can download them all by opening this clone or download, and then 
using the download zip button here. You don't have to have a GitHub account to do that, by the way. The other thing you can do is click the Excel file in the file list. Now, GitHub is only going to display plain text by default, so it's not going to be able to show you the contents of the spreadsheet. But you can see we've got a download button right here where you can download the Excel file to your computer. Lastly, let me open up said Excel file. And I want you to see, first of all here, that on row 16, I've added a highlight. You're not gonna see the highlight in the GitHub copy, but that is our split line that delineates when I learned of these 2020 changes. I recorded 14 episodes, and because the whole outline has shifted, I didn't want to disturb any of the 14 episodes I've already done, so I've left those exactly as they are. And I used episode 15 to give us a content catch-up, as I said, things like the Windows Virtual Desktop that would have, that do actually appear before this point in the objective domain. So at this point, you're all caught up. And then from now on, from episode 16 to 50, we'll go through the rest of the 2020 content, and we shouldn't expect any further changes until spring of 2021. Now you'll notice here that on row 51, we're ending at episode 50 instead of 49. The content just happens to naturally end at 49, but my OCD wouldn't let me end on 49, so I had to do 50. And that was perfect, actually, because it gives us an opportunity to do a global wrap-up. And I've got lots of important tips, tricks, and strategies for passing the AZ-900 exam, so we'll use the final episode as exam strategy. I hope you found this helpful. For content-related learning resources, if you want to know more about Windows Virtual Desktop, hit up the docs at timw.info forward slash wvd1. The Docker on Azure question, boy, that's a rabbit hole to go on go down for sure. But if you are brave, you can go ahead to timw.info forward slash doa. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you very much, and I'm glad that you're with me on this online learning guide. You can reach me at Twitter at Tech Trainer Tim. My plural site courses are at timw.info forward slash ps. My website is techtrainertim.com. I'll see you in episode 16 of 50. Take good care.